Let me remind you again where we've been. First of all, in the major overview, we looked, first of all, at the seven proofs of the Scripture starting a couple of months back. I want you to see the progression we're following. We looked at those seven indisputable proofs for the veracity of the Scripture. We're right now coming to the close of our look at the power of the Scripture. We've seen it from three aspects. The power of the Scripture to be life-changing, the power of Scripture in our lives to be that which completes our lives and is the constant source of nourishment, and then finally, what we're concluding tonight, the power of Scripture as it describes itself to confront us with the absolutes. Next week, we are going to begin looking at is perhaps what is perhaps the most majestic portrait of the scriptures and we're going to conclude our look at the Bible next week in looking at the portrait of all the scriptures are to be in one marvelous section of the scriptures in Psalm 19 and I guess I'm looking forward to that immensely because the 19th Psalm is for me the answer to so many questions people have about what about Christian psychologists and what about all the Christian pep things and books and self-help and self-esteem and all that and the 19th Psalm gives us what is God's perfect portrait of all the scriptures are to be in our lives what we covered this morning the scriptures are authoritative they are God's very word the scriptures are pure in other words they're unmixed with any blight or any error of human origin the third thing is the scriptures are complete and the reason I stress that this morning so much is that the primary focus of much of Christianity this, these days is on the charismatic movement now you say are the charismatic people Christians yes many of them are are all of them I don't think so you say why well for this reason how can Christ speaking through his spirit cause someone to be willing to follow a false prophet follow a false religion and what we find is that there are charismatics among the Eskimos among African tribal groups among Mormons among Roman Catholics among liberal Protestants and among evangelical Protestants someone has to be wrong they can't all be serving the same God with the false doctrine that they have incorporated with it. Therefore, the stress of the scriptures is that God's word is complete. We don't need anybody to get up and start babbling in an unknown tongue. I want to tell you sometime, whenever we get to this passage, there is no scripture that, that has a basis for this babbling that's going on. Every time that the scriptures record speaking in tongues, it was in a literal language. It was in a glossa, a tongue. And that's why every time it happened, people went, wow, I haven't heard good Persian in years, or I haven't good, heard good Elamite in years. And it's because God gave them the utterance, and God can still do that, but he will always follow his own rules. The last thing we saw this morning is that the scriptures are effective. And, and I hope that, that you catch the fact that all around us are people that are looking for an effective means to assuage their guilt. Remember, people in this world are looking for happiness, freedom from guilt, and security. So are we. We find our happiness in a life that has been transformed by Christ. We find our freedom from guilt in having our lives completed. The empty void that sin and our fallen condition has left us in is filled by the Scriptures being the source of truth and happiness in life. But finally, security. How do we have genuine security? by listening to the authoritative voice of Scripture, by trusting in its purity, it's inerrant, it's infallible, by not hoping for any other word, it's complete, by letting it be effective in our lives. Well, what's the fifth reason that we should allow God's Word to confront us? Well, it's because it's sufficiently the source of all that we need. Romans 10, 17. Let me read you Romans 10, 17. For the fifth confronting aspect of the scriptures is this simple truth all and every and any thing that we need for our Christian life is in this book it is sufficient it is all we need Romans 10 17 
So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ, or the word of God. Where do we even get our entrance into the truth of God's salvation? From the word of God. Not from seeing a meteorite shower, as John Denver did. Not by seeing Christ in a tortilla, as the great shrine of the tortilla was started in New York City about five years ago, as a man was making his tortilla, and when he got done baking it, he looked down and he said, Lo, I see the image of Christ. And so he put it in a shrine, and it was blessed by the church, and thousands of people have gone through his home to see the shrine of the tortilla, and many of them have had experiences. See, the Word of God is sufficient and complete. We don't need signs, wonders, or even tortillas. But look at Romans 10, 17. Faith comes from hearing the Word of God. I stress to you, first of all, the Scriptures are sufficient for generating within us faith. In the, in the welcome line this morning, someone came through and asked me a question. They said, why can't we raise our hands and ask questions during church? I said, well, it would be a bit disruptive, but you can ask me right now. And they said, the Bible was written by humans, and so was Buddha, uh, the works of Buddha. How come you think the Bible is so accurate? And I said, well, you know, I wish you'd come back tonight, because the Scriptures are the only source of divine faith. We can have faith in human things, and we can have temporary experiences, but when God works through His Word, He gives us supernatural, divine, life-changing faith that's attested by the miraculous transformation of our life, Romans 10, 17. But look at Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, because the second aspect of the sufficiency, Ephesians 2, and you know this verse also, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Our faith that makes us trust God's Word, our faith that makes us bow before Christ as Savior and Lord, our faith that causes us to give our lives in service to Him is not even something that we produce within ourselves. It is totally a gift from God. Not as a result, verse 9, of works that no one should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. The whole process was initiated by Christ. I enjoy hearing uh, the prayer on Saturday morning of one of the men. And if you've never come out to the great prayer times we have for the men at 7 o'clock on Saturday mornings, they're marvelous. And one of the men started out his prayer on Saturday by saying, Lord, we're so thankful that you began the work of salvation in us. And I thought that was just sweet to see how faithfully Christ has been in initiating, first of all, faith, and then Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, in giving us the very gift of God, which is salvation as he activated faith within us. But keep turning to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 3. Because the ultimate statement of the sufficiency that the Scriptures are can be found in 2 Timothy 3. In 2 Timothy 3, Paul is speaking his closing words. This is Paul's last will and testament, as it were, to the church through his chosen servant, Timothy, who was going to carry on his crusade for the Lord in the planting and the pastoring of local churches. And Paul is speaking to this, his son in the faith that had heard about the ministry of Paul through his first journey as he was stoned in Timothy's hometown, and then on the second journey he picks him up and takes him with him. And this is Paul's command to him, how to keep on Timothy. And he said this, all Scripture is inspired by God. That's the breathing in of God through the men. And that was another question someone asked this morning. They said, didn't men write this book? Men were used as the instruments to record it, but God breathed through them. That's why when we look at this book, yes, we have recorded for us the words of Satan. Yes, we have recorded for us the words of sinners and the words of apostates and rebellious people, but they are all faithfully in inerrant and infallible ways recorded for us because God breathed right through each of these authors. And what's amazing about inspiration is it's much like stained glass windows. We don't have any, I don't think, stained glass windows around here, but when light comes through a stained glass window, it picks up the color of that glass. 
but it still remains light. When God breathed through a Peter, it was the very word of God, but it picked up the roughness of a fisherman. When God breathed through Luke, it picked up the culture and refinement of a, of a Greek-oriented doctor. When God breathed through Paul, it picked up the meticulous, logical rhetoric of a man who was so brilliant among the most brilliant of human minds that this world has ever produced. So all scripture has been breathed by God. If someone asks you, how come you read this book, it was written by men, you can say it was recorded by men, but it is the very breath of God through them and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Now you say, how come uh, we don't study so much the Old Testament? Well, just wait. Give me five years. We'll, we'll get through it. Because all Scripture is profitable. Not all of it is commanded for us to obey, like we don't shave our head and take vows. None of you grabbed a lamb and brought it with you this morning to church. So we're not under the old economy. But every part of the Scripture are profitable in our lives to teach us. 2 Corinthians 10 we should learn from the way God judged the Israelites and not get into the same sin ourselves. We should learn why God, upset, God got upset at other groups of people. It's profitable for teaching us. It's profitable for reproving us. The same things that made God angry at his people still would make him angry today. It's also profitable for correcting us, for showing us the right way, and that's why biographies are so great. In fact, I love scriptural biographies. I love to look at what great men and what great women God used in the past in Scripture, and I love to analyze why. In fact, I have a whole Bible. I regularly read through the Bible and look for one theme all the way through, and I have my biography Bible, and one quarter of the year I read through and marked every single major personage in the Bible and tried to look at their life and see why God blessed them. And that's profitable for correcting us and for getting us into the way God wants us to go. And finally, the scriptures are, are profitable for training us in righteousness. Now listen, because here's the sufficiency in verse 17. That the man of God may be adequate. The word of God confronts us with its adequacy. It is adequate for everything we need in the Christian life. It's adequate, the end of the verse, to equip us for every good work. Some of you might say, I'm kind of shy to witness this book can equip you to be an effective witness for Christ. This book can equip you to be an effective father, to be an effective mother, to be an effective child in submission to your parents, to be an effective businessman. In fact, some of the greatest business principles ever are in this book. Because God is the one who is sufficient and adequate in his preparation to every good work in our lives. But then the last aspect of the sufficiency of Scripture is look at Acts 4.12. Turn back a little bit. And I know I'm stressing this a lot today, but I want you to know we are unique and we are different. And when I hear these stories about different ones of you, someone this week told me that you were in a different part of the state and they said, oh, where do you go to church? And, and this person said, I go to Quidnesset. And they went, oh, they're really straight down there. I thought, yes, we are. We're very straight. We're following the straight and narrow way. Let's look at Acts 4.12. Because the scriptures say, and there is salvation in no one else. Now one of you came through the line this morning and told about a death in your family, and I said, was that person a believer? And the response was, I hope they were. In other words, I don't think so. Did you know we shouldn't try and 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 at funerals get people to heaven that, that weren't on their way to heaven on earth, if you know what I mean. We should be seeking to get them to heaven while they're alive and breathing and not eulogizing them at their funerals. And I'm not saying that anybody does that, but we should live in such a sense that we acknowledge that there is salvation in no one else. If someone does not believe Jesus Christ is divine, they can't be saved. Do you understand that? That's the bottom line of the gospel. If someone does not acknowledge that Jesus Christ is God, that he is very God in human flesh, then they are denying the doctrine of Christ, which is at the heart of salvation. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must 
be saved. The scriptures are sufficient for faith, they are sufficient for salvation, they are sufficient and adequate for everything we need to be equipped to serve God. And I don't want to say this too much, I don't want to put the bookstore out of business, but I'll tell you what, if people read more of the Bible and less of all those great Christian books, we'd be a lot farther ahead in our Christian lives. Because we love to read about other people, what they say about the Bible, and we have great difficulty getting into the Bible ourselves. And that's a, an advertisement for all of us to spend more time letting the Word of God correct us, confront us, and equip us for every good work. So we see that the Scriptures are sufficient. They're the source of all we need for our Christian lives. Turn back to Psalm 12, because the sixth aspect of the eight we're looking at in this day is that the Scriptures are preserved. Now, some of you have had questions about this, and so I'm going to briefly give you a lesson in textual criticism, okay? Because a lot of you wonder, how is it possible that there are so many different versions of this book, right? Some of you out here have King James, some of you have Living Bibles, some of you have New Americans, New Internationals. Maybe if you're from a mainline church before you were saved, you might have the Revised Standard. Maybe if you're a person from a Catholic background, you might have the Douay or the Jerusalem. How can all of those be Bibles? Well, let's talk about that principle briefly tonight, because the sixth confrontive aspect of the Word of God is that the Word of God has been preserved by God. Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7. And when I say preserved, I'm not talking about the fact that we have some ancient manuscript that actually Moses wrote upon, or that actually St. John the Divine, the beloved apostle, actually wrote. But we do have the very Word of God, Psalm 12, verse 6. The Word of the Lord, or the words of the Lord, are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace on the earth, refined seven times. Thou, O Lord, wilt keep them. Thou wilt preserve him from this generation forever. The scriptures are purely preserved by God. We've already seen that they're pure and they're without error, but not only are they purely preserved without error, but they are preserved and kept by God for us. Now this preservation is twofold. First of all, what you have in your hand is the very Word of God. There's no doubts about it, okay? You say, well, but why are there textual differences and variations? Do you notice the italicized words sometimes? Do you ever notice that there's a little note in some of your Bibles saying, this verse is not in such and such manuscript? Do you ever wonder about that and say, oh my, you know, who made that choice? Well, let me just briefly give you a three-minute sketch of this. Moses wrote, the prophets kept, and, and all the Old Testament scriptures were given. Those scriptures were kept in the temple, even when they were lost, they were hidden and kept, preserved in the temple. The actual printed, handwritten copies of the scripture. They counted every letter on every line. They counted every single line and marked them down. And so they knew when they copied the scripture, there had to be 200 letters across and 50 lines down. And they did that meticulously. They were so overwhelmingly concerned to preserve the word of God. When we got to the New Testament era, it was a little different. We had apostles writing in different parts of the world and writing in different continents, as it were. As we had some over in, in Europe writing Paul to his epistles in, in Italy, we had Peter over here in Jerusalem, we had others that were traveling and writing. What about those? Well, those letters were written, and as they were written, they were recognized to be inspired because they came from the apostles. But as they got copied, people were not so careful in the copying in the first century. They did not take their pen and write the name of the Lord and wipe it off and take their pen and write the name of the Lord and wipe it off like they did with the Hebrew Old Testament. So what we have are over 5,000 different manuscripts of the New Testament. And let me condense this down to this, because after five years of Greek and being in seminary, I remember one author of many books who can speak and read 21 languages, including all those exciting ones like Ugaritic and... and uh, all the other biblical languages, Akkadian, 
he said, you know, if we took the whole New Testament, every manuscript, put them all together, and took all the differences, he said it would amount to, now this is all the disputes about all the different things, to one half of a page of the 200 and some pages of Greek text. And not one single doctrine is affected by all those variants. Do you know what they mainly are? They are spellings of names. They are whether something is an omicron, which is an O, or a theta, which is an O with a circle or a line through the middle of the circle. There are little things like that. You say, yes, but what about the fact that when you read, there are different words than mine? Well, I'll tell you something. All of the New Testament manuscripts were written in Greek. The English has been translated for so many years that sometimes we have a variant in what the word means. Like, here's a typical example. In the King James it says, for they shall not prevent those. You know, in in 1 Thessalonians 4, for they shall not prevent those, the dead in Christ will not prevent those, which are, however it goes, I can't remember my King James. Prevent in Old English was go before. And so that's been a change. It doesn't mean prevent. Nowadays, prevent means hold someone back. It doesn't mean that anymore. It means go before. And what we have in the modern translations is a looking at the Greek words and an agreement upon what they literally mean, and those Greek words that are different amount to one half of a page, and that half of a page makes no doctrinal difference in our understanding of what God has done. Now, not all translations are the same, and I've rarely talked about this, but I will say that I would be very careful with some of them. The today's English version, which you see is, uh, what's another word for it? Um, Good news for modern man, yes. That one is the start of what we have today called dynamic equivalence. When we translate the Bible and there's a Greek word, say, agapao, which means love, they say, well, we don't want to literally translate it. We want to give a dynamic equivalence to it. Now, I don't believe in in that because that's moving away from the literal word-for-word translation, and it's just saying that word means something like this. The line draws, I think the New International is about as far as we can go because the New International version is semi-dynamic equivalent. In other words, if there's a literal Hebrew word, they'll give two or three close words to it. But in the today's English version, they just give a different word that means something similar, and it's not literal. So if you want to know what Bibles to get, the King James is a historic, standard translation that we all know and love that I've memorized. The New American, which I preach from, is the most literal word-for-word translation of the Greek text that there is. And then the New International is probably the most profoundly fair with the Old Testament text translation of the poetry. So it's kind of like, if you want to have the best Bible, it would be nice to have a New International Old Testament, a New American New Testament, and all your favorite verses in King James. Uh, And maybe we can talk to the publishers about that. Because whenever I look up, I always quote King James. When I look down, I read New American. And when I want to know what the Old Testament poetry means, I read the New International. Because most of the Old Testament, over 37% of it, is written in a poetic form. Those men wrote in poetry, and when you try and distill that down into straight columns without showing that poetry, it's hard to understand it sometimes. And so that's why I really appreciate the New International's treatment of it. But, Psalm 12, God has promised His Word is pure and that He will preserve it. How has He preserved it? In the Old Testament, He preserved it by the Israelites just taking it in as a part of their life and protecting it with their lives. In the New Testament, he protected it by the proliferation of manuscripts from which, when we put them in their totality, we can compare and find where various spelling and punctuation and additions came in. Typical example. Uh, In fact, I'll show you one if you want to know about this. Here's one. Turn to 1 John chapter 5. You all wanted to be in seminary and have a textual critical view of something. 1 John 5. Oh, it's not. Here we go. Verse 8. Of course, the New American leaves it out because they don't like it. Um, There are three that bear witness, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three are in agreement. What does the King James say? It has something else in there. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Is that in there? 
Did you know that that verse, there are three that bear witness, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Did you know that that verse did not occur until the year 1500 A.D.? It was never in the Bible before that. Did you know that? Do you know how it got there? The Roman Catholic Church wanted that to be there, and so Erasmus was making his his uh, Textus Receptus, the, uh, what the King James has translated from, and it wasn't in there, and they, he said, I won't put it in unless I can have a manuscript where it shows up. And so they brought him one, and the ink was still wet. They wrote it in, because it was a Trinitarian verse. And so from the time of the Reformation on, that verse has shown up. And that's an example of something that should not shake anybody's faith because we know how that got there, and it's okay. It's true, there are three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's just that verse was not written by John where it says there are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and these three are one. The only thing John said was there are three that bear witness, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three are in agreement. That's what he said. And a later person wrote in, 500 years ago, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and these three are one because of the Trinitarian controversy going on with the Unitarian movement that was started in Europe. And that's a typical example of what a modern translation will give you a footnote and explain that about how that got there. And I'm looking forward sometime in the future when we get done with our look at alcohol and our look at some of the great Old Testament personages in prayer to take you on a course through church history, which is what I taught for many years in seminary and what I never finished as my uh, PhD in church history and just show you how we got our Bible and to show you also where our great doctrines of the church have come from. Psalm 119, which I read to you this morning, another verse on the preservation of the scripture, let me read to you. Because we know that the scriptures are preserved of God. We know that we have the very word of God. There is no doubt in our mind because God has said, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. The only problem we have is that we do not any longer possess the original autographa, the first written documents. Rather, we have copies of them, and whenever humans get involved, humans make mistakes. And that's why we must diligently study and compare those manuscripts to see where some copyist has maybe fallen asleep on the job and written an extra line in, repeated a line, or maybe, as often happened, They would write little, you ever written in your Bible, you know, a little note, something that you kind of liked, you wrote off in the corner, good verse, or this is a verse I'm witnessing. Well, often in our study of the manuscripts, we found that things have crept into the text that were a note that a scribe wrote on the corner of the manuscript, and the next guy that was writing along thought, I don't want to leave out anything, so I better put that into the text. And that's how several of these like this one about there are three that bear witness, the Father, Son, and Spirit got in. And that does not at all deprecate the Scriptures. Rather, it shows us that we have the Word of God. And although some have added more comments, those who have gone before us in their studies, and that's why you have italics in your Bible, where it's something that we know is not a part, but it's added for understanding. Also, Psalm 119, 140, which I also read this morning, says this, that... The Word of God is very pure, and it is very, very much the very breath of God revealed for us. It's not added to by man's opinion. It hasn't been lost by the passing of time. There are no lost books of the Bible. There are letters we know that Paul wrote that we do not have, but that's because God chose not to give them to us. Paul was very prolific, and if you read 1 Corinthians closely, you know that there was a letter he wrote before 1 Corinthians, and there's a letter he wrote after 1 Corinthians that we don't have. There are actually four Corinthian epistles. God gave us the ones he wanted the church to have, 1 and 2 Corinthians. The word, is not, word of God has not been destroyed by his adversaries, even though they've tried hard, and the word has not been compromised by religious error. Because if we take it in its form that God has delivered to us through the apostles and prophets, And through the church, through the centuries, we have, and we hold in our hands, the very word of God. Well, hold on to your seats. Two more, okay? The seventh aspect of what we have, what we've seen is the word of God is authoritative, it's pure, it's complete, it's effective, it's sufficient, it's preserved. The seventh aspect is it's supernatural, divine, 
extraordinary, extraterrestrial. In other words, the Word of God is out of this world. And I like that. This book is not earthly. It's not human. It's not normal. It's extraordinary. People are always looking for something exciting and different. You ought to tell them about the Bible. It's very exciting. It's very different. It's out of this world. 2 Peter 1. I'll show you what I mean by that. 2 Peter 1, and these are very, very important verses. If you've never written in the back of your Bible a little list of verses that have to do with the inspiration and authority of God's Word, this would be a good one to start your list with. 2 Peter 1, 21. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. Okay, no one sat down and said, oh, I'm going to write God's Word today. It was not written by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. This is an interesting word, moved. It's the same word that speaks of the ship that Paul was on in the concluding chapters of the book of Acts that was driven by the wind. Do you remember Eurachlodon, the great northeastern wind that came and shipwrecked Paul? That wind blew the sails and drove the ship on its way. It's the very same word right here, ferromenoi. It means born along. And these men that God used, over 40 plus authors to write this book, these men were moved by the Spirit of God. God's Spirit spoke through them, breathed into them, and bore them along in the process of writing God's Word. In other words, this book did not come from earthly or human origins. It is from out of this world. It is divine. It is extraterrestrial, extraordinary, metaphysical. It's from beyond the physical realm. It is God's very Word. It's a far and above beyond us in our mere physical time-space existence. I always like what Gordon Clark said, the great... Uh, apologist of the Christian faith and Christian philosopher. He's, he was very difficult to understand. He's so up there. You ever been around someone that's kind of <whistles> up here somewhere? Francis Schaeffer's like that. I remember staying at his home years back in Switzerland, and when you talk, or when he would talk to you, you had to have a dictionary, and you'd say, what was that word again? <laughs> uh-huh, just a second, I'm looking it up. You know, and uh, Another thing about Francis Schaeffer, he would never talk to you except at dinner or in his garden. Did you know that? If you wanted to talk to him, you had to go out and pull weeds in his garden. And he would sit there and pull weeds out of the garden and talk because he didn't like to waste time or else at dinner. But of course, dinner went for three hours. A lot of good talking. But the scriptures were not from human origin. And Gordon Clark well puts it this way. He said, God invaded our time-space box. You see, we are physical and human, and we are bound to this earth. Now, sometimes we take a little piece of earth, put it in a metal capsule, and shoot it up into the space, and let men exist up there. But as soon as their air runs out and their food runs out, they're right back down here. You see, we're kind of tied to this planet. We can't get away. And so what God did is he came from eternity and from well beyond our time-space box and he invaded it personally in Jesus Christ. And he left a divine revelation of himself supernaturally, which is the Word of God. There are many religions in our world, but there is only one divine supernatural revelation. Did you catch that? I am not one that's in a religion. If someone says, what's your religion? I say, I don't have one. I follow a revelation. A religion is a man-centered system of rules and, and all types of human philosophy and, and all types of religious things you have to follow. I don't follow something man-devised, cunningly devised fables, as the scripture calls them. We follow the prophecy, the revelation of God as he moves through humans and breathes through them his very word. There are many religions in the world. There is one revelation, and that one revelation is in 66 books, two testaments, the Bible. And it's very exclusive. Well, finally, and you've all been waiting for the finally, the scriptures are powerful because they have 
this life-changing power, this life-completing power that we looked at, and then tonight we've seen this confrontive power that they are authoritative, pure, complete, effective, sufficient. They've been preserved by God, and they're supernatural. But here's the last one. The Word of God claims to be the determiner of the destiny of every human being that has ever existed. And I guess that's what I thought would be best to conclude with tonight, because the Scriptures teach us that every living and breathing human being from the Garden of Eden till the last soul of the tribulation hour in the kingdom of God is going to be judged on the basis of God's word. Turn to Mark chapter 8. This is such a somber subject that it's best to read what our Lord Jesus Christ had to say about it. We're going to trace his words in Mark and then three passages in John and then we'll be done. Mark chapter 8, Christ says our soul destinies are determined by the very words that Christ spoke. John, or excuse me, Mark 8, 34. And he summoned the multitude with his disciples and said to them, he made a, a major word to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's sake shall save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? You know what Christ said? I determine where your soul shall spend eternity. My very words are going to be that which is going to determine your destiny. Let's look at a little more profoundly in John chapter 5. Because John really records the blunt words our Lord spoke on several occasions In the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, Christ said, He who hears my words, or my words, excuse me, and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. Do you know what? Listening to Christ's words are the only way of life eternal. Jesus said, My words... And you say, you mean just the red parts of our Bible? No, I don't like red letter editions of the Bible because every word is the word of Christ. His spirit inspired every one of them. Anything he said and all that he mediated through his spirit to those writers is divine, not just the red letters in our Bibles, but Christ said, whoever hears my words will have life eternal. John 8, 31, which I also read to you this morning, Christ said, Whoever abides in my word will be my disciple. Those who want to be believing in Christ and have eternal life must believe in his words. And then finally, look at John 11. And I know you've always heard this in light of funerals and and resurrection, but Christ was saying something very profound in John 11, 25, and 26. Remember Mary and Martha grieving over Lazarus and his death. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He said, I'm telling you, I am the only means of resurrection life. Now, how did we know about that? Was anybody there that day? None of you were, I don't think. I know that I wasn't. We know that because it's recorded by God's Spirit in His Word. And the bottom line is this, that the Scriptures are determinative. The Scriptures are that which shall determine our ultimate destiny, life eternal or perdition and destruction in hell. God's Word most confrontingly claims to be that which will determine our soul's destiny. We should spend a lot of time understanding it, preparing for meeting our Creator. I wonder tonight, have you allowed the power of the Scripture to be at work 
authoritatively in your life? If God's word says it, does that settle it for you and me? Do you trust in the purity of God's word? It's inerrant. Are you affirming in your mind that it's complete? You don't need to listen to other revelations. God has cursed any additions, any subtractions from his word. Are you allowing the word of God to be effective? And I think about how often our own unwillingness keeps God's word from performing its perfect work in us. Do you see that God's word is sufficient? We don't need to go any farther. We don't need any second blessing. We've got all the blessing, all the fullness through his word. He has preserved it. It's out of this world. And it's determinative. I trust that you'll share God's word with those that you love, that you will cling to it tightly, that we will truly have a proper portrait of God's word in our lives. Let's just thank the Lord for this privilege we've had tonight to look into his word. We thank you, O Father, for your holy word. We thank you that forever it is settled in heaven. And in earth we carry and possess and hold within our very hands your divine revelation. It is complete. It is preserved. It is so pure. And it alone determines the destiny of each of us in our response to the truth it contains. Bless to our hearts that which you would have us do in applying your word to our lives this week for Jesus' sake. Amen.